I'm Anshul. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Vita Glide, and uh, I'll be talking to you guys today about reverse engineering Android applications. Uh, I'll be showing some tools that we've been using uh, for uh, our startup and how you can use those tools to actually do a lot more stuff uh, than what we are doing currently. Um, so let me just give you an outline of the talk. Uh, I'll be speaking briefly about myself and my background. Uh, then we'll be uh, giving the motivation for the talk. That is basically why do we need to reverse engineer an Android application? What are the possible use cases? Uh, and I'll give an example of where we use it. Um, after that, we'll jump right into the techniques, right? So first, you'll need some background on what is inside an APK. Uh, what are the various ways to actually reverse engineer Android applications? And of course, uh, this sort of presentation won't be any good if I don't show you some demos. So uh, I'll be showing a few techniques uh, which uh, I've become familiar with. And uh, hopefully, you can use it uh, for fun and profit, like the title says. Uh, OK, so about me, I am the co-founder and uh, the main tech guy at Betaglide. So Betaglide is basically a performance monitoring and analytics tool for Android applications. So the way it works is that uh, we integrate our library into your APK. Then you distribute that APK to your beta users. And when your beta users actually use that uh, application, we collect uh, various data about the application and uh, generate reports based on that, which you can see uh, online uh, from your beta glide account. So I'm currently in my final year, fifth year of computer science at IIT Kharagpur. And um, I've been casually hacking on Android for uh, the last three years. Uh, it's mostly been serious work just for the last six months, maybe. Um, so yeah, motivation. So like I said, Beta Glide is a performance monitoring and analytics tool for Android applications. So what we need to do is we basically need to measure, uh, monitor interactions between the application and the device. So what do I mean by interactions? I mean basically something like I need to measure the CPU performance, uh, how much memory is allocated, uh, how much data is transferred over the network, uh, how many times the garbage collector has been called, and not just track this data, we need to correlate it with what is happening inside an application. So if I just give you a graph of CPU usage with time, that's pretty much useless. Unless I tell you, okay, this is what was happening, then your CPU usage spiked. So you can, so without that correlation, you can't have, uh, you can't analyze the data properly. So collection and correlation of data, that is basically what our tool does, uh, performance data. So what we need for this is, um, we need a reliable way to hook into an application and measure the metrics of interest. So this problem is similar to what various analytics companies do, right? And uh, the way it currently works is that, um, suppose you want to use Flurry's tool, right? So you have to spend some time and some effort into actually integrating that uh, tool uh, into your app. So now we are a really small startup, a uh, team of around three people. So we thought that, you know, we have a new tool. It's doing something that other tools do not do. If we add a barrier of entry to it, I'm not sure how many people would actually even try it out. So uh, our logic was that we'll give you a way to automatically integrate our tool with your app so that you can try it out. And if you like it, then use our library, spend some time, integrate it, and use it properly. So, so now that is one aspect. The other aspect is actually how do I measure data from the Android application? Uh, so a concrete example of this might be if I want granular data about uh, the network calls that are being made out of the application. Right? I want data such as which URL was called, what was the latency, uh, how much time did it take to transmit how much data, everything. Right? And I need to do this without having the developer actually type something, lines of code before every network call. Because an app might have many network calls and it will become really tedious for the developer. 
right? So that is where this reverse engineering aspect comes into. Uh, basically what we do is, like I said, we automatically inject the monitoring code into the application. Uh, so how do we do that? So this is the basic uh, high level approach. So what we are basically doing is we are uh, rewriting parts of a binary, which is an Android application in this case, right? And if you do it that way, then our solution is completely device agnostic, right? And it will work on any application if you do it well enough, right? So, and, and the best part is that we get code level context. Right? If we are rewriting parts of the binary, we know, okay, this function is being called, it's sending this data, we can choose what data we want. Right? And basically, the possibilities are endless. We can do whatever we want with that data. And we can collect whatever data we want. So we don't have to rely on uh, what interfaces Android already exposes for monitoring applications. We don't have to rely on DDMS. We don't have to rely on instrumentation API and its restrictions. We can basically do whatever we want. So let's uh, start uh, the reverse engineering part. So. If you just take any random APK and you unzip it, here's what you'll get. Uh, you'll get some non-code resources. So an important part of that is actually the manifest file. And of course, the resources, certificates, images, all those other stuff, right? And the, all the code of the Android application is actually in a file called classes.dex. So what is dex? Dex is Dalvik executable. So we are mostly concerned with this part, the classes.dex, and maybe some uh, Android, uh, we might want to make some changes to the manifest. Depends on what you're doing, right? Uh, so, okay, let's go into the classes.dex. So dex is uh, basically a Dalvik executable format. So it's a, it's a binary format for Dalvik virtual machine, which Android uh, runs on. And it's a little different from Java. So, like, you know, I was quite familiar with Java. I thought that Java has such good tools for instrumentation, maybe I can use them in Android. But the problem is that Android does not run on a pure Java virtual machine. It runs on a different kind of virtual machine. So I can't use typical Java approaches to solve this problem. Right, and I'll just talk, uh, give you a brief overview of the build process. So what happens is, when you actually compile uh, your Android application, your Java files are uh, compiled into class files. And then there is a custom Android tool that takes all these class files and makes one classes.dex file out of it. And that is the binary. That is what is actually running. Right, and even if you have any libraries included inside your uh, application, everything, any binary code inside your application will go into this classes.dex, into one file. Okay, um, right. Uh, now, let's talk about some reverse engineering tools. So the problem is uh, we have a classes.dex file, which is a binary. Now what you want to do is we want to modify this binary. So we can't actually modify binary hex code. It'll be too difficult, right? So we need some sort of, so there are two options. Either you decompile it to a higher level language like Java, and then you modify it and recompile it. Uh, and the other option is modifying it at the bytecode level. So the, the problem with the first approach is that um, when you are actually, so because this is not pure Java, this is Android, there's a lot of stuff that is going on in the background, which you won't be able to capture if you actually, when, when you are actually recompiling your application. So suppose you decompile your application, now you change some Java code and you're recompiling it. If you're doing this thing at the Java level, uh, you don't have any tool to actually recompile it because it's very difficult. People do not know, people haven't actually figured out how Dalvik is exactly doing this. So that's where the problem comes in. So the solution to that problem is Smalley. So what is Smalley is basically it's a, uh, it's a bytecode format for the Dalvik virtual machine. It's basically like assembly for Android. Right? So now what I'll do is I'll, decompile my application into assembly, I'll modify the assembly, then I'll recompile it. 
So that's where Smalley comes in. So Smalley is the name of the format as well as the disassembler. And uh, what do we use for all this compiling and decompiling instead of doing it manually, which can be done, but it's a little tedious. So there's a cool tool called APK tool, which uh, in a nutshell just allows you to decompile and recompile Android APKs. Right? And uh, so when you so since the Smalley code is actually um, an assembly level code, right? So if you want to reverse engineer, you'll have to understand that. And now understanding that is not trivial because it's sort of like assembly. So you need some way to correlate that Smalley with the Java code, right? And so that is where Dex to Jar comes in. So Dex to Jar converts a normal uh, Android Dex file into a Jar file. And uh, there's a really cool tool called JDGUI, which allows you to decompile any Jar file and uh, it decompiles it into Java. So you can see the source code, right? So I think all these things uh, and how they fit into each other will be clear when I show you a demo. So let's see the demo. <coughs> okay, so let's say I have this simple plain Android application, doesn't do anything, right? Uh, now I build it, right? So in this folder, uh, you can see there's a droidcontest.apk. Right? This is the APK file. So how does APK tool work? I'll just, APK tool D, so D stands for decompile. And uh, so when I decompile it, it creates a new folder with the same name as the small e. So there are two folders here, you can see. Uh, there's a manifest file, and there's a resources folder, and there's a small e folder. So all the resources and the resources folder, all the code in Smalley format is inside this Smalley folder. So you can see it follows a typical Java package folder kind of thing. So all libraries that were included uh, were actually decompiled and uh, stored in this folder. Okay, so let's look at the main activity Smalley. So this is the small e corresponding to our plain uh, Android application. This is actually the small e of the main activity dot Java file, right? So like you can imagine, uh, you'll get a separate small e file for every class that you have defined. So that's the way it works. Um, and you can see there are some methods. There is uh, an on create method. This is how it is represented. These locals are basically uh, your local registers for that method. So the way uh, method calling works in Smalley is that uh, there are few reserved registers for uh, sending parameters and getting the results. And in addition to that, you can use uh, local registers to do your own thing. Uh, so this is like uh, a example of a method call so what he's doing here is he's calling the Android uh, activity on create function, right? And he's passing in a bundle. So this part here, uh, the one that I've highlighted, this tells, uh, this is basically telling you what is the format of the function call, right? It's not passing any parameters. It's just saying that, okay, you have to call an activity on create function and you have to pass it a bundle, right? And these P0, P1 are actually the parameters passed. So this P0 corresponds to this activity, right? And this P1 corresponds to this bundle. So in the register P1, I have actually an instance of this bundle, right? And that is being passed in this message, message call. But this message call is also attached to an object instance. Which instance? That instance is stored in P0. So that's a simple example of how a method call works. Uh, we'll find this stuff useful a little later on, right? So let's. So as you can see, uh, OK, 
Okay, so now let's, uh, I'll show you a demo of Dex to Jar and JDGUI. <coughs> so in my folder over here, I have uh, the APK of true color, right? Yeah, this is the APK. So now we'll try and uh, see the code. Okay, so so this is the text to jar script, and I'll call it on true caller APK. already exists. Right. So basically it just uh, create this jar file. I already have it so it didn't uh, recreate it. So this is the this is the output jar file. Now if you want to view this jar file, you can just open it in JDGUI. Right. And here you can see all the code of that Android application. So as you can see it is obfuscated. So they are probably using something like ProGuard to obfuscate the code before releasing it. So obfuscated code causes some problems, but you can still do a lot of stuff, like I'll show you uh, shortly. Okay. Right, so this is an overview of the approach. So. So as you can see, it's very simple to decompile, and APK can APK tool can also do recompiling of Smalley. So this is the approach: you use APK tool, decompile it into Smalley, then you modify that Smalley, then you use APK tool to rebuild it into an APK, and then use that APK. That APK is actually the modified application that you were looking for. Right. So now, what are the problems with this? The problem is that. Uh, if you're so if you're doing this by hand it's pretty much simple to do but like we were doing you need uh, at some point of time you will probably have to automate the whole code injection process right so you need an automated way to find the small D that you want to replace depending on whatever you want to do so I'll give a concrete example of this later but so the way so you need to find the relevant small D you need to a uh, non-hacky way to actually modify it. Now, what do I mean by non-hacky? You can just do a simple find and replace, right? Find this function, replace it with that function. But the problem is that you don't know how the user is actually using it. Uh, did he use three registers? Did he use four registers? Maybe the the code that you want to eject will require one more register. And there's, uh, you know, there's a limitation on the number of registers that you can have in a method. So if he's already using all the registers, you'll have to think about how to uh, do your thing and still not modify what he is doing, right? Let's put it that way. And you need a generalized way to do it. So these are the problems with this approach. You can do cool stuff with it uh, on a per application basis, you know, manually decompiling it, reading the smally, modifying it manually, and then compiling. That's not that difficult. But if you want to do this automatically, there are some issues. So you'll have to really think about how I can do this. Uh, how do I design my application so that it doesn't interfere and it's easy, easy to inject, right? It doesn't use many registers, for example. Okay, so let me give an example of a real world use case where we are actually using it. So among other things, our application also makes touch heat maps. So what does that mean? That suppose 10 people are using your application, it will give you a heat map that is a collection of all the touch events of all the users across all the app sessions that uh, they have created, right? So, and we need to monitor touch events in all activities. And we need to do this automatically. So we don't want the developer to actually write code inside his application. We just want that if he gives us an APK, we do something with it and we are able to track it. So there's a very easy way to do this. Uh, you, in Android, there's a dispatch touch function. So that 
that is associated with an activity. Right? So what this function will do is it will catch all touch events inside that activity. Right? And you have an option to either consume it or pass it on to the next event handler. Right? So naively what you need to do is you just need to write a dispatch touch event function inside an activity. Right? But now you need to do this automatically. So I'll show an easy way to do this. Think about how, what problems will come and all that. I'm not going too much detail into what we are actually doing, right? So, okay, so this is uh, the smallly corresponding to uh, the dispatch touch function, dispatch touch event function. So what this function does is it's a standard Android API call. It takes a motion event parameter, right? And that motion event has basically the coordinates of where the user touched it. So what we're doing is that we are just calling our library function, right? Catch touch event. And after that, we're calling the next level super uh, event handler. So that whatever default behavior was going to happen will now happen. But we have recorded this touch, right? So how do I insert this? Just copy it and paste it over here. So we have copied this function. Now, since I modified the smallly, I'll need to build it. Okay, so he, it's already built an APK file. So you'll see here it's created this folder. And now there's another dist folder because it's actually building the smallie. So inside that dist folder, you'll find this is an APK that when you run this APK, all the touch events inside the activities will <coughs> be recorded by a library. So now you must be wondering, okay, that's fine. I called my library from inside the application. But how do I actually include the library, right? So including the library is really simple. What we have done is that uh, we have a folder that contains the smallie of our library, right? Our library decompiled into smallie. It's this folder, b -fried proto folder, right? This has all the smallie of all our uh, library. And uh, we just copy paste this into the relevant package folder. So since our package name is com.example.b -fried proto, inside the smallie folder, com example b -fried proto proto folder, we'll put all the smallie of our library, and that's it. We don't need to do anything else. Now, whenever we call any of these, we can import these anywhere inside the application. We can call any of these functions from inside the application. There's no problem. Only thing you need to do is copy paste the smallie, right? So for example, if you want to, so how do you use this? If you want to extend the, the if you want to extend an application to do something else that you want, so create a library for it, you know, attach it with an APK, compile, create that APK, and then, then decompile that APK with APK tool, just pick out your library code and copy paste it to your target APK. Right? And then when you build that, your library is automatically included. And for calling the library, you can use the technique that I just showed you. Just take the smallie of the relevant method and copy paste it. That, so if you design it properly, it should work. Uh, it does work actually. And if you design it properly, that's all you need to do, right? And also it depends on your use case. So if you want, so this is a very simple example that I'm just adding a function to some activity. I may, the function might already be defined, right? The user might already have defined a dispatch touch event function. What would I do in that case? So something similar, you'll need to find that function and add your line somewhere. But again, think uh, about the potential problems that this can cause and how you will do this in a non-hacky way. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, now I'll give an exa other example of a cool use case for this. So you must have heard of the caller ID application called TrueCaller, right? So I'll just tell you should, for people who don't know, uh, what it does is when you install the application, it reads your contact list and send it to their server. Now what happens is that if you're using the application, anytime you get a call from a person uh, whose number is not saved in your contacts, they'll actually look it up in their database and give you the ID of that person. Right? So it's a crowdsource kind of ca caller ID where you share your, con everybody shares their contacts, and so everybody has the contact of everybody else. So now the problem with this is that since it is uh, picking data directly out of your contact list, right? generally, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not very careful while adding contacts. I mean, I tend to give stupid names. So, <laughs> So that may cause problem. I mean, if some, some, my, my friend called some other friend who doesn't have his number. Now, I have saved his number with a stupid name. Now, that person in his caller ID will get that same stupid name, right? It's a, it's a kind of a breach of privacy. So I don't want, to, I want the benefit, but I don't want the negative part. So I want the caller ID, but I don't want to share my contacts, right? And what I have is just the, APK of true caller. So how will I do this? Right? So it's not that difficult to think about it. We have already established how we can decompile an application, change it, recompile it, and then use it. That's all you need to do on a high level. Now what you need to figure out is inside the application, where is a true caller actually calling the contacts API and getting the contact? And over there, instead of actually sending the contact name, you send some other randomly generated string. Right? So first part is identifying the part where the application does what you want to change. So let's. So for that, JDGUI is really useful. So like I said, <coughs> so what I did over here was, um, so I have this true caller uh, source code. Right? Now since there is only one way to actually access the contacts in Android, so I search for contacts in the code, right? And I get this weird class, L dot class, inside truecaller dot D, right? And over here, I have an interesting looking uh, log message, get all contacts error. So that means, that gives me an idea over here that user is probably trying to get the contacts from your contact list, right? And if you just look at this code over here, So it's actually fetching your display name and it's sending it to this variable, right? Now, if you want to change this, we'll just set local c dot b to something else, right? Instead of whatever was fetched from the contact list, right? So now we have a broad idea of where you want to start. So inside test, inside the true caller smally, there is a, a d package. Inside that, there's a class called l right? And inside that, there is some function called A. So these function names are not really useful, but this log message is really useful because it is, it comes only once, right? So I can just search in the smally for this string and I'll look around and see um, uh, where my target actually is. So let's look at the smally of this. So this is the L dot smally file. So as you can see, this, <coughs> so over here, you have a, you're defining an array of string with the string's ID and display name, right? So actually, if you go little, if you come over here, okay. So what this is doing is, it's uh, sending a query to some cursor that is returning uh, some object, right? And it's calling a get long function on that. Right? So, but but the interesting part again, not the functions. The interesting part is the strings, right? That's how you actually strings log messages. That that is how you try to actually find out where the action is actually happening. So, so look at this line, right? What it is doing is it is calling a function with the passing the parameter string display name. The result of that function is then sent to another function. And that result is given 
to a variable called b local c dot b now this local c as you can probably guess from the name is probably an instance of a class called c right so that all these thing all these observations are really helpful when you're working with smally because it is an assembler format right so now correlated with this right i'm defining a string display name i'm invoking a function passing in the string right so as you can see i stored the string in v2 and when i'm calling the function i'm also passing this v2 so that means that string is actually going as a parameter to that function right move result v2 so whatever the result of that function was that is now stored in v2 and v2 is again passed to the second function the get string function right and here you can incidentally see the return type and all those things some additional details about what these functions are doing now the result of this function is again moved to v2 and look at this line so this is the crucial line this is basically local c dot b equal to the result of whatever right so i defined a string i passed it to a function i got the result i passed it to another function i got that result and that i am assigning to this instance this thing over here right this variable i am assigning this string right so if you don't want uh, the contacts to come just change this remove all this stuff right remove it and then your v2 will actually contain a string right and that string is directly passed to your c to your target variable so every time uh, any time uh, your uh, true caller fetches a contact instead of getting the actual contact name it will just get display name so now you should uh, probably modify this a bit instead of sending one string for all contact you should probably give different names to each unique string right that will require a little bit of further tinkering because probably true caller will be checking all these things on its server side so you need to fool it as much as possible right uh so this is a very simple way to do something uh but if you want a reliable way to do it you have to actually think a lot more um okay so this is the approach right so details are left for you guys so i have already figured out how to do this and i have already told you the important parts right uh the background so i would really like it if you guys should actually go and try this uh because unless you actually try it uh you won't understand how it works you will understand what constraints are there so go and try this and if you find any other very interesting use cases for an approach like this uh, do contact me uh, i'm really interested in all this stuff so i'll be uh, that's my talk uh, if you guys have any questions
again, power of open source. I asked him questions about his code, and he gave me some help. Um, so I've actually open sourced how to do A and B. And if you search for me on GitHub, like on a person, there's a small library called Compiler. So smally means uh, compile in Icelandic. Back smally means decompile. And operator means transform. So there's a library that actually helps you go to uh, smally code, find a particular method. Right now I'm searching for HTTP methods, and then modify them. So if you want to take that code, you can use that and change it for your own use case. Any other questions? What measures would you advise app developers to take to uh, protect their code from reverse engineering, apart from ProGuard and make sure no logging? So, yeah, from one thing you could do is probably remove all uh, uh, logs before you actually deploy your APK. <laughs> because logs, yeah, but it's a two-sided sword. If you remove all logs, if something goes wrong, you won't know. Right? But there's probably nothing you can do, I mean. I haven't tried it, but it should work because ultimately things are working on Dalvik VM. And I guess that ultimately uh, what you will get is ultimately even with NDK, you, what you will get is a classes.dex file, right? Which has everything. Okay, so yeah, I, I haven't really tried it, uh, so I can't comment, but you should try it. So I mean, this is a really generic approach. I mean, it's nothing wrong with Java that allows me to do this. I mean, I can do this with anything, right? as long as I have an assembly format for it. Right, right. So that that so yeah, that is an important point that I forgot to mention. So you can make this APK, but for running it on any phone, you actually need to sign it with some certificate, right? So so. Like if you're just testing it on your mobile, use a dev certificate or something. And don't distribute apps with, yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Are there any similar tools to re reverse engineer iOS apps? I have no idea about that, but I'm sure there must be. I mean, like I said, this will work with, should work with almost any language. I mean, Smalley and APK tools are tools that are written for Android format, right? There must be similar tools. I mean, there, there are probably more iOS hackers than Android hackers, like not now, maybe three, four years back. So they must have cracked it by now, definitely. Uh, right, so guys, that's it. Um, I'll be around, so if you want to ask any other questions, you're most welcome. Thanks.